You know, uh, we, we are a church of prayer. Mighty prayer warriors inhabit the walls of this church. And uh, many people have been spared. Many people have um, gone through some deep water. And one of the things that we do in this church is we walk our city. I, I, I don't live in this city. I pastor in this city. But uh, I live in Monrovia. Most of the people, although a few people live in El Monte, live in other cities. But one of the things that we've done for many, many, many years is that we walk our city and we pray over our city uh, in the month of January. We will be notifying our people, and if you're here, and we welcome you, if you're new in the church today, hope you'll keep coming. We walk from border to border. Uh, where the uh, an El Monte sign is, we start there. We have probably walked at some time or another every city in the San Gabriel Valley, including Pomona, which is a large, large city. And so I want to I want to teach today. I'm gonna. The, 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 at the heart of teaching is repetition. We we teach and we come from different positions, but we reinforce the main theme of that petition. And so today we're gonna teach on praying God's plan for your assigned territories. You might not think so, but God is very very concerned about planet Earth. And God's word holds no reservation in making clear God's intentions for what I call his creative masterpiece, and that's Earth. Genesis, the book of Genesis, which is, means the beginning, opens with the establishment of earthly dominion and man's ordained commitment to the territory of Eden. We see God placing man and woman in Eden, assigning that area to them, commanding them, and giving them dominion over the whole earth, everything on it, in it, under it. God has given man dominion. We know that through the fall of man, he forfeited that dominion, and Jesus' purpose coming in the form of a baby because man caused the fall, and man had to redeem man from the fall. There was none available except Jesus, so Jesus became fully man, as we just celebrated it not too long ago, as baby Jesus. In Genesis 2, you might want to turn there, it's in 7 and 15, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is the point of life. You know, a lot of people think, well, we're made from the earth, we're made from dust, so that's when life began for man. No, life began for man when God breathed his own breath into man's nostrils. And it says, and man became a living being. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Our responsibility, uh, the theme for our men's ministries this year is, yes, in a sense, I'm paraphrasing it, but we are our brother's keeper. We, we are to pray for one another. We are to pray for our brothers and our sisters. The first five books of Moses, which is in, we call it the Pentateuch, deals with the movement, preparation, and finally the possession of the promised land. God made his promise of territorial possession through a blood covenant. Blood covenants begin with Abraham, 
And of course, the crucifixion is a blood covenant. It's a, it's a redeeming covenant. And it was reinforced through every generation of Israel's founding fathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's reinforced again and again and again and again. What is God really doing through his word? God's word reveals himself through the land. You know, I taught yesterday from the book, uh, from Daniel, and neither Daniel or Nebuchadnezzar, the, the, the king of the Babylonian empire, had any understanding at that time beginning time that they were in the hands of a sovereign God and that they were going to be used mightily to fulfill God's will and God's purpose. Now I'm sure Dan Daniel, who was a teenager at the time, when everything he loved and knew was ripped from him, he was transported to Babylon and put under a, a leader by Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel had no sense that God was going to use him in his interpretation of visions and dreams to influence many, many dynasties and many, many kings. But as you progress through Daniel, the first six chapters of Daniel are basically historical. It tells you the events of Daniel's life. How his influence on a king would finally lead to his salvation. I'm sure that he was going through deep water, tough tribulation times. But as he was true to God, and Daniel was, he was a real man of God, a man of prayer, he began to realize that his purpose in life was to, in a sense, change the destinies of thousands and thousands of people. This is what Romans 1-2 says. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I like the History Channel, and I watch a lot of uh, World War II footage. And as I watch World War II footage, I am amazed at how America came through World War II and was the arsenal of the world, supplied the free world with weapons, tanks, everything that was needed. And with a head start that Nazi Germany under Hitler had, I'm amazed every time I see this footage how we won the war. How, how America came through World War II, I know that we have a lot of young people here and they are probably saying, I, I don't even know what he's talking about. And, and the great sacrifice and, and the courage of the generations who went to foreign places and islands in the Pacific and really some of those islands you could measure them in just miles. And yet, eight, nine, ten thousand Marines, Army especially, Marines especially, gave their lives, and as many as 40, 50,000 were wounded. And so, so we, we see how God. He showed himself and proved himself through the territories all across the world. My point is the things that are made, which is creation, 
revealed to all men the eternal power and divine nature of the true God. The affairs of earth are of paramount interest to God. It amazes me about the call of God on pastors' lives. I felt the same thing. I, my first call of God was to the city of El Monte. And then it seems after a few years that that kind of gets lost in the logbooks of our mind. But we should be ever mindful of the city that God has called us to. And my hope is that some pastor in every city will take the leadership of his city, open his church to other pastors, and they, on a certain date in January, walk their own cities for God. Every book of the Bible refers to some literal, tangible aspect of earthly life. You know, we, we got some crazy things going on in Washington, D.C. right now. But God spoke to me this last week, and he said, but do you know that you're in charge of what's going on in, in Washington? Through your prayers, you can change things. You can bring this ridiculous nonsense that politicians seem to engage in to a screeching halt. The Bible speaks of nations. It speaks of cities. It speaks of people. The nation of Israel began as a family, multiplied into a clan, and when it left Egypt, estimated at four and a half million, it was a complete nation. It describes vineyards, wells, crops of every description. God is very concerned about territories. It mentions mountain ranges, seas, rivers. Many, many bodies of water are prominently mentioned in its writings. It speaks to moon and stars. When man, when man was arguing about whether the earth was round or square, flat, and, and men were warned as they went off on journeys, be careful because you'll fall off the earth. You'll, you'll go off the flat areas. And yet the Bible talked about the circle of the earth. So God even then was more knowledgeable than what man was. Talks about moon, stars, wind, and rain. These Items are used in various descriptions of everyday life. So when did God stop being interested in the earth? He hasn't. The church is put in charge. We are the caretakers. That's why it's vital that we be praying, fasting at times. We, we can put a halt, I, I, I've shared with this because of the flu epidemic, but my mother had a little brother named Roland. He died way back in the ninth, early 1900s of, a, of the flu. It was called the Spanish flu, and World War I soldiers brought it, and it became what we call a pandemic. 30 million people died. And I often wonder, do people think that that couldn't happen again? Already many people have passed away from this strain of flu. Charlene's grandmother died of that same malady. My, my, my little uncle died in Missouri. Her grandmother died in, in the state of Washington. Her mother was born, and three days later, she died 
of that horrible pandemic that was ravaging America at that time. Even the book of Revelation reveals the prongs of earthly territorial conflict. Listen to Acts 17, 26. But from one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. We, we need to understand and not complain and not gripe about and we, we need to be like Daniel. Daniel, I'm sure, had reservations and fears. But he, he, he declared who his God was. And he lived to be an old, old man and doing the bidding of God. It is God who determines the exact times and places in history during which nation, nations would emerge and live. Why am I sharing this with you? To, to let you know that the land you live in is your land. It's your responsibility. God has assigned to you territories. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God set into motion an ultimate fulfillment, a plan to restore full fellowship with the Father. When Christ died on the cross, full restored fellowship for both man and the earth was set into motion. Jesus had to die. Or we would still be under the subjection of a satanic God. Most of the world, by the way, is. It become a living reality through full salvation in Jesus Christ. When salvation to me, it's not just redemption from sin, but it's an open door to what God gave to man in the beginning. Financial prosperity, deliverance. Think about it. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's why I kind of admonish the parents today. You, you, you've got to pray for your children. You've got to know how important and how vital your words are. They form blessings or curses. You need to speak. You need to get up at night and instead of saying, well, the baby woke me up and, and, and I'm a little bit perturbed and you walk on the floor, stand in their rooms and declare the glory of God upon them. You don't know whether they're going to be a Daniel or not. They, 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 they might be a Washington. They might be a MacArthur. They might, be, they might save their country. The, the reason I am so, one of my theses is on abortion, the aborting of America. We complain and we, and, and, and we holler and we yell about the diseases that are killing us today. And many of the babies that we've aborted would have been grown up and probably solved medical issues and problems if we would have just let them live. All of the things that I just mentioned, it became a living reality through full salvation in Jesus Christ. We need to understand the prize that we receive when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. It's, it's of vital importance that we understand walking our own streets is like avoiding abortion. We may be the salvation of our neighborhood. We may be the salvation of our neighbors. What Jesus did for us when he issued salvation on our behalf, he gave us full and restored rulership, finally was made possible. 
It amazes me, the Bible is a forerunner of the New Testament, the Old Testament being the forerunner of the New Testament. All, all the patriarchs, all the leaders of the Old Testament were wealthy beyond their dreams. They were envied by their neighbors. They would go out with small armies and defeat huge armies. Well, you know, we, we read the story about Jericho. Joshua was giving command to go into the promised land that a whole nation missed. Said, we can't, we can't do it. We can't take it. And that older generation died before they ever, eight days from, from Egypt to the promise, eight days. Forty years it took for that nation generation of older people to die. And the first thing that meets them when they cross the Jordan is Jericho. They, they could line up chariots on the walls of Jericho and race them. And God gives command to Joshua. And he says, before you do anything, and we know the story, they marched around the walls of Jericho. They were given certain requirements. Not number one, and the one that we should really remember, they were told, and keep your big mouth shut. Because they would have been like us. Well, is God crazy? How can we get past this city with its huge walls and its, its armies and its armament? God gave them specific orders to do this and do this and do this. Then he says, blow those trumpets and shout. Now that, that would seemingly be about as dumb as a sack of hammers. But the walls came tumbling down. And they couldn't possess the promised land without clearing the way and eliminating Jericho. That's what we need to learn today. You can be blessed beyond your wildest dreams. You, ladies, whether you want to believe it or not, I don't know if you're married to a smart aleck man who says, you'll never make it without me. Well, if he's not serving God, if he's serving Satan and he's leading you, he's right. You're never going to make it. The smartest thing you could do is bind that sucker in the blood of Jesus and move on with the Lord Jesus Christ and let him make you what you ought to be. You're a pastor. You shouldn't be saying that. Says who? The smart aleck husband sitting there beside you today? God is your boss. There, there is no edict higher than the word of God. I, I've, known, I've known men that got so jealous of God. At my last church, I wasn't there, thank God. A husband came down and raised all kinds of, frankly, forgive me here, but hell. Because he was jealous that his wife had received Jesus Christ as personal Savior. You know, men and women can get crazy. And so, so understand, no, no one can restrict you. No one can hinder you except you. So begin to proclaim the promises of God. It's okay. You can be a multimillionaire. God, God loves it. I would that you would prosper as your soul prospers. It's not fun being poor. I don't know where some of this doctrine comes from. I served with a woman in my last church that took great pride in her suffering for Jesus. God wanted to heal her. As far as I know, 
she never got healed. I was in a hospital at the end of this year for five and a half weeks. I'm here to tell you, it's a bummer. I, 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 did not, I did not for one minute say, oh, well, God's really enjoying this and he's got me in this position. And then, I hated it. I begged Charlene, I begged Jay, I begged Jamie, get me out of this place. And only by the prayers of this church and people all over that I've served with from time to time, their prayers is what brought me home. I'm amazed. We're back in the Arboretum walking two miles. You know, even I told Charlene, the first day I said, you know what, let's just take the flat land. Well, I know me. So after we walked the first time, I said, you know what, this is crazy, let's just go up the hill. And we went up the hill and walked five times last week. And, and that commercial is right about exercise. Nobody, nobody wants to exercise. But I'm here to tell you, you've got to rise up You've got to start proclaiming who you are in God and do something to get yourself whole because God wants to use you for his glory. You know, people say, how old are you? And I'll say, I'm 80. I don't understand what that makes a hill of beans difference. Caleb was 80, and he, you know what he said? He said, give me my mountain. You promised me a mountain when I was 40. Now, I'm 80, give me that mountain. And he took it. Age is just not relevant. Mind power is what counts. Colossians 1, 19, 24, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. We got everything we need in Jesus, fullness of everything. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him. We, we, can, we can change Washington. We can change corrupt government in cities. I, I'm telling you, the worst thing that California can do is to legalize marijuana. That's the worst thing they can do. And, you know, and, and people go, well, it's medical marijuana. I'm healed by his stripes, not medical marijuana. Reconciling all things to himself. All things. Diseases. We may have to fast. We may have, may have to pray. Well, one of the diseases that has healed much in this church is cancer. If you've got cancer, you're in the right place. I appreciate City of Hope. But we got a city of hope here, right in our own midst. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, we have peace. Colossians 2, 14, 15, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. And we all know that. Which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's on the cross of Jesus. Don't, don't let yesterday mess up today and tomorrow. That's under the blood. It's as far as east is from west. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. 
What, what, what can hold you back? You. Me. You know, I, I, it's a, it always amazed me about cemeteries. A land full of flesh and, and bones. The Christian spirit is in heaven. And, and yet, I've had people tell me, I can't succeed because they've chained themselves to a tombstone. There's nothing there that can hold you back. But you've got to move forward. You've got to move on. Clearing the land of your possession is your responsibility. Although God owns the land, he, he places certain nations and territories under human stewardship. Even in captivity, Israel came to realize that God was in control. Jeremiah 32, 41, yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. We're planted here. You know, there's, there's a book out, but it's true. We who are here shouldn't continually be dreaming of going somewhere else. We're here because God has us here. We're a legacy. I, I met with the deacon board today, and, and they're working on a paper. And that paper is going to say, these are our programs. Do you attend? And if you don't, why don't you? I, I, when I taught the men a couple of weeks ago, I said the first thing I would ask myself, what do I need to do for my God? In other words, getting involved. The trouble with too many people, they're still involved with yesterdays. Dreaming about yesterday. Well, I'll remember that forever. And they're hindering themselves. They're holding themselves back. God isn't holding you back. You're holding yourselves back. This is what Jeremiah 32, 41. Yes, I will rejoice over them. God is rejoicing over you today. And, and you sitting there today and saying, well, I don't feel like anybody's rejoicing over me, doesn't make that true. God rejoices over you. You know, that's, that's like, and, and I, you know, the Bible says this. The Bible says the one who doesn't believe in God is a fool. And the trouble with too many Christians is that they listen to fools. Well, I don't believe God or, or Jesus was crucified for my sins. Well, I don't care. He was. You can't change that. We can act like fools, but a fool is a fool. I will rejoice over them to do them good. I don't need a Donald Trump or a Getty to do good over me. I got a God who's going to do good over me. Say that with me. I have a God who's going to do good for me. I'm going to be wealthy. I'm going to be healthy. I'm smart. And I'm getting smarter. Because God is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? Yeah. 
If you got if you got a fool out of your life, you ought to be rejoicing. You ought to be jumping up and down and dancing all over the place. Thank you, Jesus. That I don't have to listen to that moron anymore. And I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Joseph goes into bondage as a slave and ends up the number two guy over the whole land that had enslaved him. God used his servant and the grain production from the land to save and incubate his chosen people. Joseph didn't know that Israel was going to end up in Egypt when he was taken into bondage caused by his own family. A famine drove his little family and that family unit into Egypt and because God had a plan for Joseph, he ends up, in a sense, fathering that entire clan till it reaches four and a half million people. God used Moses to lead through phase two. Moses should have been drowned. That was, that was the edict of the Pharaoh, kill all the males. But his mother had divine wisdom. I don't know who made that little, little ark out of bulrushes and put pitch on it. You know, people who think they're really smart, think about this. She assigns his, his sister to watch over him, and then she takes and sees that the Pharaoh's daughter finds the baby, Moses, has pity on him. Then she's smart enough to go up and say, hey, by the way, you need a nurse? Well, yeah, I do. Well, I know a lady. She goes home and gets Moses' mother, and she can suckle him and raise him and get paid for it. <clears throat> it's amazing. God is so smart. Moses came to understand his territorial responsibilities and moved his people from Egypt to the borders of the Promised Land. And Joshua, in phase three, took the children into the land of promise. L listen to this, Joshua 1.3, Every place that the sole of your fo foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said, to Moses. Just so there was no mistakes. He says, now I'm going to tell you what I told Moses. Joshua was given the responsibility of ridding the land, not only the enemies of God's people, but also the giants that inhabited the land of Canaan. Pastor Lampas got a church probably for 10 years because we walked. There, there was a science of the mind work going on in that building. We all turned and we said, we, we, we bind that spirit in the name of Jesus, and Father, we're asking you to find a full gospel pastor and give that building to him. And he did. Praise chapel. They, they, they excommunicated them out of the carpenter's hall down the street. I don't know how many churches they contacted. They contacted us and said, we need a building. So we claim Praise Chapel. And he moved in probably five, six, seven years ago. We can do anything in the name of Jesus. Well, it must have been easy for Joshua. Really? Well, he was given the responsibility of ridding the land, not only the enemies of God's people, but also the giants that inhabited the land of Canaan. Don't we react that way? But there's giants over there.
and a, a, and a little shepherd boy God used to kill one of those giants. And he had four brothers, and just for safety, he took four more rocks. I, I think about that, I thought, man, I would have had to have some real big pockets, because my faith would have been that I would have probably taken 1,000 to 1,500 rocks. So what is your assigned territory? It's your neighborhood, it's your family, it's your church. Pastors and churches are not just called to a church, they're called to a city. This is our city. And we've walked probably your city, Baldwin Park, Azusa, Arcadia. Coming to an understanding of the following scripture will help the church to more fully understand their calling from God. Listen to this, Psalms 10, 5, 6. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance. God is your portion. He's your inheritance. And my cup, you maintain my lot. The times have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Say that with me. Lord, you say that I have a good inheritance. I'm not poor. I'm rich. I'm not sick. I'm whole. I can do anything that Christ asked me to do because I am his portion. So the Lord assigns our portion and cup. This alone should be enough to inspire us. Next we see that God secures all that is ours. If what we have been given is of God and he guards it, then it must be what God wants us to have. Too many Christians have been sold a bill of goods. God wants to bless you. And you've got to claim it. It's going to take courage. But God says that he will give you courage and he'll give you strength. I, I say this all the time, and, and you probably get tired of it, but it's, let's say it. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Christ strengthens you. The next verse should bring us peace and remove the inner turmoil of struggle and strife. The land you have given to me is a pleasant land. We need to say that. The land you have given to me is a pleasant land. Amen. All those Bible stories you've been reading. If Joshua could rid the land of the giants, we can rid the land of giants. If Paul can do all things, we can do all things. Don't, don't ask, you know, I drive a Ford, but don't ask for a Ford when God wants you to drive a Cadillac. That's how crazy we are. Oh, no, I don't deserve a, a Cadillac. Sure you do. You can have a Rolls Royce if you want to. We, we were laughing last night. I, I, I don't know why it came to me. And Sharni said, yes, I was there. I was in the hospital... Sicker than a dog. This woman comes bouncing down the deal, comes in and tells me how she, much she loves my mustache. I 
I was so scroungy looking that my doctor told my family, shave this guy. Go get a razor and shave him. <laughs> I'm thinking, is this woman got a full deck here? You know. God has you in the right church and in the right city. But do you realize it and do you accept it? God declares what he has called you to is a wonderful inheritance. You're not broke. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I, I, that, every time I, you know, I told you this story, but and he's repeating, these guys were in Texas and they wanted to improve some buildings, a property. They didn't have the money. And somebody quoted that scripture. Well, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And while they're in there talking and praying, these officials, some old cowboy that owns probably 200,000 cattle and a million acres in Texas comes in and says, I just sold some cattle. And he wanted to tithe to that district headquarters. Isn't that amazing? God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and he ended up selling some of them so that this headquarters could be blessed. That's the way you've got to start thinking. Your footsteps are ordered of God. Do you know that today? My footsteps are ordered of God. I, I like Jack Hayford's, he, this, he made this statement, and, he, and he, he's right. Jack Hayford makes a profound statement when he says, God did not call him to build big churches, although he built one at 10,000. Rather, he called him to build big people. That's what God's interested in, is big people. When you study the word lot, it means destiny, portion, lands fallen to a person through inheritance. I don't need my inheritance in heaven, I need it here. God is saying in Psalm 16, 5 and 6, that he has already given you the land of your inheritance. The word line also refers to inheritance. Knowing God has placed you where you are should bring you the element of peace. You don't have to wonder anymore, but you do have to get busy. Stop worrying and start reclaiming and building. In other words, work your farm, your possession. Whatever you're doing in life, you can make it bigger, you can increase it. Every pastor and every congregation is called to not only be an influence on his church, he is also called to be an influence on his city, his community, and his assigned territories. Pastors and saints don't spend your time wishing for what may never be or, or worse, for, the God, for what God does not want you to have. Have you ever received something that you thought you just had to have, and then when you got it, you thought, oh my God, what did I do? I, I, I bought a, a sports car. It was a beautiful sports car. Had it all tuck and roll. Had set-in windows. I was miserable trying to drive that thing. I thought it was in a coffin. You know, I, I felt like I had claustrophobia. Phobia. You know, had those set-in windows. I, I said to, to the Lord, I hate this car. I wish I didn't have it. Be beautiful car, just, just didn't like it. I'm, dr I'm driving down the street here in El Monte, and the guy thought it was a four-way stop, and he 
pulls right out in front of me. I totaled that sucker. God said, you don't, you don't like it? Man, I, can, I can help you in 30 seconds. <laughs> well, Charlene's heart. I'm in, the, I'm in the wrecker coming home, and he's pulling this car. Just totaled. Be careful what you wish for. If God wants you to move, he'll let you know. He, he doesn't need you to bring a U-Haul. You need to realize unless you have totally missed God, he probably has you right where he wants you. If we want a bigger church, then we're going to have to build it. Build from the city, from the community. God has called you to. Stop wishing and start fishing. God has drawn your lots and lines and has given you a good inheritance. Make your territorial commitment and begin where you are at, are at with God has, has given you. I, I, should, I got that all messed up. Make your territorial commitment and begin where you are with what God has given you. Start right now. Don't live in misery. If you've got, if you've got some roads to repair and things, to go do it. Just go do it. 